Sing, turn to my sorrows. It's yours. 
gonna be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, it is joy comes with the morning. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down. And something may pass, Lord, your mercy will last. As you open my eyes to the work of your hands, and my heart will find grace, I'll delight in your way. As you open my eyes to the work of your hands.
just to open my eyes to the work of your hand. Jesus, open my eyes to the work of your hands. Oceans will fall, nations come at the whisper of your call. Hope will rise, glory show. Good afternoon, friends. Again, this afternoon, uh, we will talk about uh, the Lord and His Word and His exhortation to the Christians. And I hope that everyone will receive blessings as the Lord uh, speak to us and uh, deliver to us uh, His message and His will this uh, uh, afternoon. But again, uh, let me say thank you for the opportunity. And before anything else, let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Our Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have. And I pray that you may be the one to bless every listener uh, as well as the preacher this afternoon. Uh, help me preach your word and help me uh, exegete it and explain it the best uh, possible where everyone can understand it. And let your Holy Spirit be the one to convict us of our sin and bring us to uh, whatever will you want us to be repentance if it is your will, and get right if it is your will for your uh, children. And uh, I pray that uh, you bless this uh, opportunity wherever the listeners and the watchers are. I trust that uh, your word will speak to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, this afternoon, I want to talk about the reasons uh, why we should let vengeance be at the Lord's. If you noticed, last Sunday I spoke about vengeance. It is not ours. It is the Lord's. Now I will give you the reasons why we should let vengeance to be the Lord or to be the Lord's not to be ours. And uh, uh, there's a verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, that says, Dearly beloved, avenge, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Have you ever been angry at someone? Uh, has someone ever done something to you that made you want to get back at them? I know we all uh, experience the same. 
I remember when I was a teenage, I was a teenager. I was uh, playing a basketball game at that time. And let's just say, as the ball passed, I got hit pretty good. It was at that point I made up my mind that before this game was over, I was going to get my revenge on the person who hit me. Unfortunately for the rest of the game, I wasn't able to do it. It's quite possible you have been in this scenario with something uh, way more serious than a basketball game. Someone hurts you or angers you in the same way and your response is that you want to get back at that person or group of people. Well, generally speaking, this is how the progression work. You hurt, your hurt leads to anger and your anger leads to the desire to revenge. And ultimately, if that desire remains, you may eventually act on it. While this may satisfy the fleshly or carnal side of our nature, uh, there is a problem we may face as Christians because of this verse found in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 35 says, To me belongeth vengeance, and recompense their foot shall side in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Uh, wait a minute, that doesn't seem fair, you may say. Why is vengeance the Lord's? Why can't I exact the revenge? Aside from the fact that God is better at it, I want to give you the three reasons why vengeance should be the Lord's and not ours. But first of all, uh, what does it mean uh, when God said, no, when God said, to me belongeth vengeance. What God mean when he said it? Well, in the Hebrew, the word vengeance means to punish or inflict retribution. It can be used when the repayment for a harm was uh, justified. It can also mean to repay harm with more harm where the vengeance is coming from a place of hostility. This is because the first harm was unnecessary. When you apply this meaning to the verse, you see that the right to repay is God's, God alone. Why you also see what you, uh, what you also see is that he will eventually repay, meaning no offense is ever left unpunished. And I will show you how at the end of the message. Okay? If you are honest, the problem we sometimes have is that the repayment doesn't come swiftly enough. And sometimes, not in the manner we want it. In the Bible, David had a similar thought. Uh, look at the question he asked in Psalms, uh, thir uh, Psalms 13. Psalms chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Uh, I want to read it to you. How long will thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? 
what he was really saying is, God, you are moving too slow. Can you speed up and get to the place of revenge on my enemies? If you have ever felt that way, just know that God is not is slow to respond. It's just that His ways are not our ways. And I want us to remember that and never forget that thing, that God, okay, that God is just that His ways are not our ways. God's ways are not ours. We have different ways and God has different ways. Remember, God is infinite. God is a spirit. He is a an almighty uh, being, and we are not. We're a finite being. We are uh, people filled with weaknesses, and God has no weakness, even once. So let's talk about the context of Deuteronomy chapter 32 uh, at this time. What is fascinating about the cha this chapter is who Moses is speaking to. The Israelites are about to enter into the promised land and Moses is giving them a history lesson and a warning. The vengeance that God is referring to is not directed at the enemies of Israel but towards the enemies within Israel. Those that would turn their hearts from the true and living God towards other gods or idols. By doing this, especially because they have the truth, they are provoking God to anger. They are provoking God to jealousy without repentance, and because they know better, eventually God will bring about punishments of, or retribution. And this leads us to a unique contrast when we consider the vengeance of God. It's easy to desire God's vengeance of all when someone else is the object of it. There is almost a self-righteous attitude about it. On the flip side, or in the other side, we are the ones deserving of God's vengeance. It's amazing how we cry out for God's mercy. If it is us, it is simply, and re the, uh, it is simply the reality of how our nature are wired get the other one by uh, by uh, get the other one but uh, have mercy on me as we always think uh, the way it is it is for reasons like this why vengeance is the Lord's now as Christians why should we not seek revenge I want to give you three reasons, just three, why vengeance is the Lord's and why we should not seek revenge as Christians, okay? I want us to understand the reasons why we as Christians should not be seeking revenge because it's, it is the Lord's and it is not ours, okay? So I want to give you the first, the first reason is because we find it difficult to separate vengeance and anger. It's difficult to distinguish or read between the lines or see the difference between uh, vengeance and anger. When anger, feelings of revenge, 
and hate have in common is that they typically involve negative situations and lead to behaviors that can be disadvantageous to others. Anger, feelings of revenge, and hate are characterized by a different focus. For example, the goal of anger is to restore or change the, uh, the unjust situation. This can be achieved through coercion aimed at the anger eliciting perpetrator, though not necessarily. Now, experiencing anger in the third party situations when there is both a perpetrator and a victim also motivates more prosocial behaviors focused on the victim. Experiences of humiliation or gratitude can be, or, or, or uh, humiliation or ridicule can be regarded as an appraisal shared both by hate and feelings of revenge. However, it seems that hate is less likely to reduce such a self-focus as compared to feelings of revenge. Quite often we think about revenge. We don't just want revenge. We want the other person to suffer. We want to inflict harm to satisfy our anger. When I got up after being hit in my, uh, in my uh, basketball game, I wanted my opponent to feel pain because we are coming from this place. Our vengeance is based in an anger that can lead us to sin. It moves from justice from the actions of inflicting pain on the one who caused it. This is not the spirit which, with which God pays out vengeance. Okay? And secondly, and I want to repeat it, this is not the spirit with, with which God pays out vengeance. Okay? Now, the second part is God's vengeance is not reckless. It is often redemptive. Perhaps you still remember the Genesis account about the flood. Some of the earliest narrative of divine retribution go back to 2000 before Christ. The book of Genesis tells us the story of catastrophic flood. After a God, after warning uh, the people for the imminent judgment, decided to bring rain down to end the uproar wickedness of humankind. As I said, God warns the people through the righteous man. His name is Noah about the impending disaster. I think everyone remembers that Noah preached for many, many years. As a matter of fact, to be exact, it's 120 years Noah preached and warned the people about the imminent coming of God's judgment if they will not repent and stop from their wicked ways. Well, Noah saves himself and his people by constructing a boat. Elements of this story are later echoed in the, in the book of the Bible of Genesis. God is angry because, of the, uh, because the earth is filled with violence caused by human beings and vows to destroy both them and the earth. Noah is a blameless man, according to the scriptures, and God tells him to build an ark 
that would be large enough to hold his family, and two of all living creatures, although humanity perishes in a deluge, uh, in a deluge Noah preserves life on earth. It might seem straightforward to say that natural disasters in the Bible are associated with God's anger, but that means missing the complexity of the context. God makes a covenant with Noah. In the book of Genesis, in the Genesis account, after the water subside, God makes a covenant with Noah. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, and I read, And I will establish my covenant with you, God said, Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Well, this promise not to destroy humankind is also referred to in the book of Isaiah. In a vision, God says that just as he vowed to Noah that water would never again cover the earth, so too he promised not to be angry again. There is a biblical approach to suffering. The question of God's anger is ultimately connected to the problem of human suffering. After all, how can a loving God cause indiscriminate human misery? We first need to look at how suffering is portrayed in the Bible. For example, it is also in the book of Isaiah that we find the story of the man of sorrows. A man who takes on the sufferings of others and is an image of piety. He is Jesus Christ. While the Bible does not uh, does it speak of human suffering because of their sins, some of the most moving passages speak about how innocent people suffer as well. The book of Job relates the story of a blameless and upright man. Job, whom Satan caused to experience all sorts of calamities. The suffering becomes so intense that Job wishes he had never been born. God then speaks from the heavens and explains to Job that God's ways surpasses humans or human understanding. Like I told you a while ago, God's thought it na is not our thought. God's ways is different from human ways. The same way, God's way of seeing, seeing things is different from the way we see things. The Bible recognizes that the people suffer often th through no fault of their own. Most famously, Psalm 42 is an external extended lament about suffering that nonetheless concludes by praising God. The Bible views on suffering cannot be encapsulated by a single mess, uh, message. Sometimes suffering is caused by God, sometimes by Satan, and sometimes by other human beings. But sometimes the purpose behind suffering remains hidden. The New Testament does refer to the Genesis flood when talking about God punishing human beings. For example, Paul, the apostle, observes that God brought the flood on the ungodly people of the world. Earthquakes are also mentioned as signs of the end times in the book of Revelation. But the epistle of James, a letter in the New Testament often attributed to Jesus' brother or stepbrother, 
says that God tests no one. In fact, those who endure trials are eventually rewarded. The early Christian philosopher Origen argued that through suffering we can understand our own weaknesses and dependence on God. In, ver in this view, suffering is not punishment, but something that draws human beings closer to God and to one another. Moving to more contemporary reflections, philosopher Dewey uh, Sefania Phillips argues that it is a mistaken to attribute to God a human feeling like anger because God lies beyond human reality. Believing that hurricanes, floods, and earthquakes are God's punishment reduces the divine to human terms. Some theologians totally reject the idea of suffering as, an, as divine retribution because such as an, uh, uh, such an act would be unworthy of a merciful God. From a Christian's perspective, God also suffered by being crucified on the cross as Jesus Christ. And so as one scholar, I would argue that God suffers with people in Texas and Florida, as well as with those in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, parts of Africa and Mexico, and other parts of the world. In the words of German theologian, Jürgen Moltmann, and this is what he said, God heals the sickness and the griefs by making sickness and griefs, his suffering and his grief. So instead of dwelling on God's wrath, we need to understand God's kindness and mercy. And that in times of crisis and distress, it is kindness. You know, it is kindness. It is mercy that requires us to reach out to those who need comfort and assistance. It is our kindness. It is our mercy that is required so we can be able to reach out to those who are in need of our comfort and assistance. One of the reasons God often brings vengeance is to repay sin. His desire many times is to hopefully lead a person to repentance. God's discipline or vengeance is not reckless. It carries with it a redemptive value. If we are going to be honest, we know sometimes we don't always like this. We may even think it's unfair. That's why vengeance really is the Lord's because he always has the bigger picture in mind. God is only one who can exact revenge and show mercy at the same time. Vengeance to repay coupled with mercy is ready to redeem. That is not usually our goal and why vengeance belongs to the Lord. And the third is, God's vengeance does not come from the seat of revenge, but the seat of justice. Okay? It doesn't come from the seat of revenge, but the seat of justice. You know, when God brings vengeance, his heart is not just get back at people. He's executing justice. Because God is just, where there is wrong or sin committed, then justice must be served. 
when God would bring judgment on a people, it is because their sin had reached a point where he, where God, could no longer hold it back. This is not a byproduct of a need of revenge. It is a reality of God who is just. Because our God is just, then His revenge is according to His justice as well. His vengeance always flows from a place of justice, not a place of revenge. When it comes to vengeance, it may appear that some things may be or may go unpunished. But this is not true. All sin gets punished and all vengeance is exacted. The question is, who will God pour out His vengeance on? Good question. Remember, His vengeance is a result of His just nature. Let me explain further because I know you might be confused. For the person who sins and doesn't repent, God will pour out His justice or vengeance on that person. This person will not escape. For the one who repents, God will forgive, and they will escape God's vengeance. You are probably saying, well, how is God's vengeance or justice served in the person who repents? The difference is that in the second instance, God pours His judgment out on Christ, satisfying His justice and vengeance. I told you before, His ways are not our ways. In wonderful chapter of Isaiah chapter 53, we see God pouring out on Jesus His vengeance and wrath for our sin. There is one verse I want you to notice. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. I want you to open your Bibles there and look at it. Okay, look at it. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. Okay, and listen to me as I read it. Yet it pleased the Lord to boost him. It pleased the Lord to boost him. He had put him to grief. Wow. One translation says, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Can you imagine that? It pleased the Lord to crush, to crush the Lord, to crush Jesus. And it pleased God the Father. You know why? Because of your sin. Because of my sin. Because of us. That it pleased God the Father to see His Son be hung on the cross and there be separated from Him. That never have happened ever from eternity past. This is why vengeance is the Lord's, and it should always stay that way. In this case, God repaid Christ on our behalf. I am sure this would not have been the plan we would have come up with. However, in doing, in doing so, this ensures that no offense ever goes unpunished. Either God's vengeance will pour out on or on Jesus, or will pour out on you or on Jesus, the reality is you decide. There is no better place for vengeance 
if I had to put a bow on the short, uh, on this short sermon, it would simply be this. There is no better place for vengeance to be than with God. There's no better place to be, to be uh, for vengeance to be, uh, but to be with God. It is rightfully His, and it should stay that way. Ultimately, it will be what is most fair for everyone. God has proven himself to not only be a just God, but also a fair God. You can be certain when God is exacting vengeance, it is always right and always appreciate and always just. And yes, it is. Shall we bow and go to the Lord in prayer first? Father, thank you for the message. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for taking our sins away, Lord, and because of the penalty he made for my sin and sins of everybody, Lord. I had a chance to come to Jesus and be forgiven. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that somehow someone may come to you and take this opportunity to be forgiven because Jesus, because we have a God who is a just God and a forgiving God. Thank you for this opportunity of preaching uh, this message on vengeance, Lord. I pray that this would have been uh, a help to everyone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Again, thank you so much for everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. And until next Sunday, we will meet again. All right? Thank you and God bless.